Edinburgh, capital of Scotland. It features the architectural contrast of a medieval old town and a new town in Georgian style. With its castle hill, fortress and nearby attractions. In the centre of the old town, Edinburgh Castle sits atop the basalt cone of a long extinct volcano, the heart of the nation. This, the most visited castle in Scotland, is still guarded by soldiers, but it's now mainly tourists who storm the defiant rock. Northumbrian King Edwin commanded the castle to be built in the 7th century AD. The Castle on the Hill, Edinburgh. Over the centuries, the castle has been repeatedly destroyed and rebuilt, adding to the colourful pages of adventurous Scottish history. The National War Museum is housed within a former munitions store and displays unique ancient weaponry, uniforms, paintings and regimental coats of arms. Scotland's military tradition of Highland soldiers from the 17th century until the present day. The castle was subject to a total of 13 attacks and, including a time when Mary Stuart lived within its walls, defied a siege of almost two years. The Regimental Museum of the Royal Scots commemorates the oldest infantry regiment of the British Army, founded in 1633. Something to capture the attention, at precisely one o'clock each day, a cannon shot rings out. A daily tradition since June 1861, and the residents of Edinburgh set their clocks accordingly. In the 15th century, the Royal Palace was built on the area's highest ground, an enclosed building complex around Crown Square. The Great Hall was completed in 1511 and served as the main location of all royal ceremonies. Close by are stored Scotland's crown jewels, which include the scepter, crown and sword of state. The cannon of the Half Moon Battery and Four Wall Battery protected the highest plateau and surveyed the only access to the castle from which any possible attack could be made. The Royal Mile leads from the mighty fortress downwards, a sloping road from which narrow streets branch off, containing various buildings. These are only the upper floors of the up to 15-storey first skyscrapers in Europe, whose underworld has now been closed. In the backyards are small museums, and disguised freedom fighters and proud war veterans accompany tourists on their way down towards the valley below. The Royal Mile divides into various sections with descriptive names. This one is the Lawn Market, in which fine linen was sold, and the Grass Market, where for centuries a cattle market was held. St Giles Cathedral is closely associated with Scottish history. This, one of the main churches of Presbyterianism, is named after the patron of the city.
John Knox was pastor here and succeeded in making Presbyterianism Scotland's official religion. The late Gothic building mainly dates from the 15th century and impresses with its columns, blue ceiling and new colourful glass windows. Its pipe organ is often heard, the sound reverberating across the many tombs, monuments and dark grey walls of the cathedral. A true gem built of the finest wood and stone is the fascinating chapel of the Scottish Order of the Thistle, to which 16 noble knights belong. St Giles is a place of reformation and where the Church of Scotland was born. Just off the Upper Royal Mile is the church and cemetery of Greyfriars with its many historical and atmospheric tombs. This cemetery became well known due to two Irishmen who exhumed newly buried corpses in 1827 in order to sell them to the local anatomical institute. Therefore, it's hardly surprising that the city's ghost tours are so popular, with visits to the cemetery late at night and tales of dirty deeds and deadly goings on. In the church itself, in the center of the site, there's now no sign of a devastating gunpowder explosion and fire which once took place here. Greyfriars Bobby attained much celebrity, a loyal Skye Terrier who, following the funeral of his master, guarded the grave for 14 years before he too finally passed away. The Royal Mile continues. Edinburgh's historic tourist route and also its oldest street. Next, the former home of John Knox. It was here that the famous reformer resided and led debates on questions of faith with Mary Queen of Scots. He was a highly convincing speaker and even complained of the inappropriate moral conduct of the Queen. The road narrows and the slope disappears. Here there's an exciting contrast of styles, the modern Scottish Parliament and the old Royal Palace. Beyond, the rocks of Holyrood Park, and in front, a white exhibition marquee. The Palace of Holyrood House is the official Scottish residence of the British Queen, and was originally just an extension to the eponymous Abbey. James IV initiated construction of the palace in 1498, which was subsequently extended. For some years, Mary Queen of Scots resided here. A well-kept park surrounds the ruins of both abbey and castle, directly at the foot of the rocks. Here, Holyrood Park begins. Since the 12th century, royal hunts took place here. 
Today it's used for recreation and covers 270 acres. The ruins of St. Anthony's Chapel, situated high on cliffs above a lake. A splendid and atmospheric setting located on Edinburgh's very own mountain. From here begins the steep ascent of what is an extinct volcano, one of the city's seven hills. The view improves with each step. The 250 meter high peak is known as Arthur's Seat. It's not known why and certainly has nothing to do with King Arthur. On the other side, we descend past St. Margaret's Loch, a small lake with a swan's nest, egrets and ancient rune stones. The final section leads to Duddingston Loch, a fine nature reserve with ducks and geese. Duddingston itself is a dreamy village with its very old Sheephead Inn and built in 1124 Duddingston Kirk where Bonnie Prince Charlie once stayed and Walter Scott was church elder. It's one of the oldest Norman churches in Scotland and is still in use today. In 1913, a zoo was opened here. It's well known for breeding endangered species, and numerous talks and displays turn the visit into an educational adventure. It's situated on a hillside. The animals live in well-maintained enclosures. Its tropical house contains plants, butterflies and birds, quite a contrast to the climate normally associated with the region. Feeding is also permitted. Large outdoor enclosures provide much space for the diverse wildlife that is well looked after in this royal zoo. Around a thousand animals inhabit the zoo, including white rhinos, meerkats, penguins and monkeys. In a depression between Castle Hill and Newtown, there was once a small lake which later became a cesspit. At the western entrance of Princes Street Gardens is the Church of St Cuthbert with its old cemetery. Where formerly Nor Loch, the cesspit, once gave off its odours, in 1876 a park was created. A green oasis in a city that provides relaxation and with luck a touch of sun. In an open air theatre on the hillside adjacent to Princes Street, various concerts take place. In 
summer there's an ocean of blossoming flowers and a splendid view from the large fountain up to the castle. The people of Edinburgh appreciate their city and take advantage of every sunny day. Here, the building plans of 22-year-old James Craig were realized. A broad boulevard called The Mound divides the western and eastern sections of the gardens. The museums of the Royal Scottish Academy are located here. A relief of the old town provides an insight to its structure. The wide street leads up to the castle from where there's a view of the eastern section of the gardens. The East Princess Street gardens are smaller but just as popular. A green paradise with large trees and well manicured lawns. On the upper edge of the slope, the magnificent buildings of Princess Street can be seen. Here stands probably the largest monument in the world dedicated to a writer, the Sir Walter Scott Monument. Modern city planning adapted harmoniously into that of the past. The North Bridge became the main axis between the two districts. At the end of Princess Street is the luxurious Balmoral Hotel that was built as a station hotel at the beginning of the 20th century. Its clock tower served as a landmark for both travelers and city dwellers alike. Beyond rises another hill, Calton Hill, which features a bizarre combination of monuments, including the observatory. And the National Monument. Twelve Doric columns of neoclassical design built by William Henry Playfair. From here, the view of Holyrood House and Park is an unforgettable experience, especially in the early evening light. These many monuments inspired the city to be described as the Athens of the North. And Robert Louis Stevenson also lent his own brand of exuberant descriptions to the city's remarkable scenery. Charlotte Square, with its central equestrian monument of Prince Albert, is considered to be a masterpiece of urban design. Newtown was designed as a healthy environment and as a representative and distinguished capital for the city's wealthier inhabitants. Palatial buildings surround it, jewels of the Georgian era. The owners were wealthy, but not necessarily noble. On three floors and house number seven, 18th century life can be observed. Up to six servants worked in the household and furniture, Paintings, china, silver and numerous works of art indicate the lifestyle of the gentry of those times. Dean Village is a tranquil rural suburb of Edinburgh, situated along a small river, the Water of Leith, and located below Newtown.
much vegetation, many villas and rows of small houses line the narrow streets along the slopes of the river valley. A natural idyll on the edge of the city. The former mill village is now a popular and expensive residential area. The journey along the River Leith to its outlet in the North Sea is a romantic route. Here once stood several water mills where millers took advantage of the power of water. Today the calm sound of flowing water accompanies a pleasant walk. About halfway along the route is the Royal Botanic Garden, Britain's second oldest botanical garden founded in 1670. A huge and abundant collection with more than 15,000 species of plants that can be seen here both outdoors and in a number of greenhouses throughout the year. This expansive garden also contains the famous Pringle Chinese Collection, the largest collection of Chinese wildflowers outside China. Between meadows and huge old trees is the white Victorian palm house and contemporary Scottish works of art. There are also 10 air-conditioned glass houses and in a rock garden, alpine plants. And small ponds attract birds and aquatic animals. Now comes the final section of the River Leith to its mouth. A narrow path snakes its way along the riverbank. between sections that are similar to meadows, but water seems to be motionless. But next the Leith widens and passes over a weir. Finally, we arrive at our destination. At high tide, the sea reaches here. Edinburgh's historic port welcomes us with its seaside promenade, renovated warehouses and residential buildings that reveal its former prosperity. In the 12th century, it was a tiny fishing village. But in Victorian times, Leith became an important maritime trading centre for the city of Edinburgh. With the decline of maritime trade in the 1970s, the harbour area of Scotland's gateway to the world went into decline. However, this city by the sea, with its signal tower, has since enjoyed a revival with its historic old buildings having been transformed into apartments and a general air of chic renewal now dominating the area. Next to the remaining docks with their cranes, containers and warehouses are restaurants, bars and a large shopping centre. This city of poets and culture is one of the oldest urban regions in Europe and the home of the Scottish nation. Edinburgh, 
is both nostalgic and romantic, the proud heart of an historic land.